Welcome to the uh, presentation this morning of Iron Ore 2 um, by Richard Dunlop. It's uh, my pleasure um, to welcome uh, Richard to the University and also to uh, acknowledge the Vice-Chancellor who will be speaking shortly. I'd also like to acknowledge the Durumbal people, on who, the traditional owners of the land uh, on, who, on where we meet. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our, uh, the University's art curator, Sue Smith, who will speak a bit about the painting. Thanks, Graham, and good morning, everyone. Lovely to see you all out here. I'd like to thank uh, Richard for his generous gift, which was made under the Cultural Gifts Program. Um, it's one of his major works called Iron Ore Two, and it's an oil painting on Belgian linen, and it's from his series, which focused on mapping and Australian landscape painting that he did from 2007 to 2008. This beautiful work um, is an important and timely acquisition from a prominent Australian contemporary artist for the CQ University collection which was established in 1973 and has now grown to encompass about 500 Australian works um, and then another group of Indigenous works from Fiji, Samoa, New Zealand and Canada. Rockhampton was the birthplace for the artist's father who was a university scholar and mining, the subject of the work, is of course a significant economic activity for uh, the communities or many of the communities that the university serves from Mackay uh, to Emerald to Gladstone and Rockhampton. Um, a poetic work, Iron Ore II, I believe, invites us to lose ourselves in the sublime timelessness of the Australian interior while reflecting upon Australia's past exploration and present mining endeavours. The canvas displays the artist's unique gifts as a painter of lyrical, shimmering images which respond both to the environments and the experiences of his own time and to the visual languages and genres that he has inherited as an artist working in the early 21st century. Iron Ore too employs a unique mix of perspectives on the one picture plane, a bird's eye view integrated with the latitudinal or layered cross-sectional perspective favoured by the early European explorers. It represents a certain indebtedness to Sidney Nolan's Central Australian series and Fred Williams's strip paintings while making, of course, its own fresh and intelligent contribution to the Australian landscape painting tradition. This painting strengthens the CQ University art collection immensely and we're very pleased to be able to display it prominently in this public area of one of our main buildings. In the coming years, it will help us to explore new stories about the Australian landscape, tradition and Australian art history uh, that we look forward to sharing with the university's staff, students and visitors. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. I'd now like to introduce our Vice-Chancellor uh, Vice and President, Professor Scott Bowman. Uh, thank you very much, Graham. And can I uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today, the Durumbal people, and welcome everybody here, my colleagues from the university, uh, also good friends from the community, and in particular, Richard. Uh, a very warm welcome to the university and to central Queensland. Uh, this is a really important day for us uh, because we are now taking our art collection seriously again. Uh, we have got some absolutely fantastic pieces of art in our collection, uh, but I think for a few years the university lost its way in its art collection and uh, really stopped collecting to a large extent. Uh, but when I came on board, I really wanted to re-engage uh, with art, and we were incredibly lucky to get Sue Smith to come along and be our art curator. I think it's the first time the university has had a full-time uh, art curator. And you might say, well, why, why is a university getting involved in art? You know, surely this is about training engineers and nurses and social workers and, and whoever. 
and really that's where we should be concentrating things on. Well, I disagree. Uh, most people in this room would know that I believe that really universities should be about engagement. And we have set course to be Australia's most engaged university, a university that is really in tune with the communities it serves. And I think art is a very important part of that. So that's why we've uh, employed a full-time curator, that's why we're doing uh, restoration work on the collection, and that's why we've now started collecting again. And this is a fantastic uh, start to us uh, collecting again. Uh, and we really do thank you, Richard, for this fantastic uh, work. There's a lot of uh, talk at the moment in universities that we've got to operate more like businesses, like corporate entities, um, and get our act together. The interesting thing is this university has been doing that for a number of years, and we are incredibly successful at the moment. At the moment, uh, we are Australia's fastest growing university in terms of Australian students coming to the university. Uh, through the hard work of Professor Graham Pegg over there, we've put on something like 20 or 30 new programs. Uh, we're doing more research. Our publications have doubled this year. So that's all going well. And that's all really working like a corporation in a fairly economic, rationalist kind of way. But I think universities can be much more than that. Uh, and they should do some things which just don't make sense uh, from an economic rationalist point of view. I've got to say, I am incredibly disappointed, really disappointed with some of my colleagues at other universities that are looking uh, to close down creative arts, performing arts and the humanities. That, uh, I think, is a great shame. And I see some universities that are running massive surpluses and are at the same time cutting out creative and performing arts. I think that is so short-sighted. We've made a commitment here in the performing arts that we will support the performing arts. We won't let it go to the wall, even though from an economic rationalist point of view, it might make no sense at all. Because we still have one-on-one -on -one singing instruction, one-on-one -on -one acting instruction. But you know, that's what universities should do. They should be doing things like that. Yes, some parts will be very successful economically and they can be used to support other parts uh, that aren't so successful. I also hear um, some of the politicians uh, really saying that we should be uh, specialising and cutting out some programmes. We shouldn't give students so much choice. In fact, that was a very strong message last week, that there is too much choice in the system uh, and too many students uh, doing things that aren't leading to jobs at the end. What I would say to that is, I've got to tone this down probably, uh, <laughs> absolute rubbish. Uh, all right, bullshit. <laughs> My belief is that somewhere between 80 and 90% of our students are making career decisions when they sign up to a degree. They're doing degrees that naturally lead to a career outcome. They will be a nurse at the end, they will be an engineer, a social worker, a health and safety specialist, etc, etc. 80 to 90% of our students make those decisions. We then have, in my opinion, an elite of students, somewhere between 10 and 20%, that actually do what their heart tells them. And that may be theatre study, it might be music, it might be creative arts, it might be humanities, or whatever. And I say they're the elite because they really are the brave students that really do what they really want to do. And surely they are the students that really enrich Australia, the students that go on to be artists or performing artists, that really make Australia a special place. So I say while we've got 80 or 90% of students going for those vo vocational outcomes, surely as a university and as a country, we can really encourage and support those 10 to 20% that are doing the absolutely fascinating things in the arts. And this university will continue to do that and in fact look to build that. Our motto as a university is be what you want to be and we want everyone to be what they want to be. 
So art is very important to the university. Marilyn Luck got into my ear the day that I started at the university and said we had to re-engage in art. She's been a fantastic uh, uh, motivator for art in this region and she is also one of the driving forces behind the university getting back into art. So I thank you, Marilyn. So, art stop now. I'll stop now, uh, and then back to Graham. But again, Richard, thank you very much. An incredible piece of work. Thank you, Scott. It's, it's now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, and also the artist of uh, Iron Ore 2, Mr. Richard Dunlop. Richard. Hi, folks. Thanks, Graham. Uh, thanks, Scott and uh, Sue, who are known for 20 years, has been um, very instrumental in uh, 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 reinforcing for me that uh, Rockhampton people are enormously generous hosts and, uh, and most resilient people, given what you've been through in the last few years. Um, I'll, I'll be a bit like uh, Henry VIII uh, with his wife, so I won't be keeping you long. Um, <laughs> I just thought uh, this would be an opportunity to just tell a couple of stories and I guess um, dispel a couple of curiosities as, say, why the thing is called Iron Ore 2 rather than Iron Ore 1 or 5 or whatever else. So I'll just tell a couple of yarns. Um, my father was actually born in Rockhampton, so Rockhampton's uh, always had a soft spot for me. He was uh, born here in 1924, which if you, you do your sums, uh, meant that uh, in his... Uh, childhood, he uh, lived through the Depression, and the Depression in Rockhampton was not a, a pretty place. His father worked for the railways, so he was laid off and all this sort of stuff. Um, and most of the meals became whatever grew in the backyard. So as an adult, he couldn't even eat a banana or a mango because he had that so many times as a child. Um, so He's, he's now passed, but uh, I'm, I'm sure he would have been happy for uh, a painting which uh, had something of uh, this area representing it sitting in a library because he ended up as a, 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 a university lecturer himself uh, at uh, Kelvin Grove Teachers College. And um, there was art in, in uh, my home when I was a kid. Um, but there wasn't uh, art necessarily in everyone's home. And um, my own experiences of, of going to university and seeing a, a painting by a person called Richard Larter um, altered my perception of things. I, I, uh, my mum had, uh, you know, the Women's Weekly's uh, images of Sidney Nolan's or Russell Drysdale, that sort of thing at home. But, but uh, this painting I saw in a university, Richard Larter, of course, had uh, on the same surface uh, people having sex, his nude wife, uh, 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 a Women's Weekly cover perhaps, and um, you know, Richard Nixon uh, and uh, that famous photo of a Vietnamese soldier being assassinated. And I thought, what the hell is this? You know, like it, this isn't, this is an art that I'm accustomed to. And um, uh, and I thought, what a liberal committee, what a forthright committee it was to to expose students uh, to this sort of stuff. What a good thing it was. And um, and it set me off, uh, traipsing around the university then, to find out, uh, what, find out what else they had. And um, I went down, you know, valley and, and uphill and poking my head around uh, the corners of offices of the lecturers to see what they had on their walls and what was in the, the university collection. And um, some of these pictures became friends to me, you know, and I'd be quite upset if they got moved to different places. And, and, uh, and I researched some of the artists and uh, eventually now some of my own paintings have ended up in uh, what's now QUT's collection. Um, but what also struck me at that time was that um, some, some of the pictures had a straightforward meaning and would sort of shout at you and were sort of didactic. And I soon got over those. But 
the ones that always puzzled me that I couldn't quite work out, like this Richard Larter one, which had all of these different disparate images um, that he'd painted in about the 70s, um, always stuck with me as a puzzle and I, and I wanted to form a narrative around them and to make sense of them. And it's good for students in a university setting to do that, I think, um, that things don't give up their secrets too quickly. Um, I actually had the chance to ask Richard Larter in person later on, um, you know, what was it? What, 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 what was he trying to communicate? What was it all about? I said, well, nothing really. <laughs> it, it was just a, you know, it was just a pile of things that were in my environment. I mean, there was a Woman's Weekly at home, but there was also porn, and there was Rickston Nixon on the TV, and there was a Vietnam War going on. And in a way, uh, what, he, what he sort of um, was driving at was what we currently experience, which is this whole series of disparate and fragmented images that come at us from different sources, which we have to make some sense of, um, whether it's through the net or TV. Or it's a fast, faster and faster moving set of images that uh, we get bombarded with. Um, so I thought it was pretty prescient in that way. So it did, it did mean something, even though he couldn't put his finger on it necessarily. Um, iron ore too, what the hell does that mean? Um, well, there is an iron ore painting. And um, when, you, when you sell your paintings through a commercial gallery, for all sorts of reasons, you don't know where in the world they end up. Um, so someone bought uh, a similar painting and I, I imagine I'll bump into it one day or other, or, or it might turn up in a magazine or something or other. But I don't know where it is. Um, but I liked it, and uh, I wanted to do an iron ore too. And uh, so there it is. That's, that's the reason for the title. The, the actual iron ore mines, to me, are, are almost like um, uh, architecture. Uh, you know, it's almost like an inverted pyramid or, or a ziggurat or something like that. They're, they're, a, they're a sculpted um, form. And, um, and as Sue said, there's, there's artists that uh, are well known in Australia who have tried to, tried to um, express what it is that's Australian about our interior spaces, uh, whether it's Sydney Knoll and Central Australian paintings or whether it's um, Fred Williams' paintings of the Pilbara. Um, so I thought I'd have a go myself. And, um, and I wanted to have them as, as strips so that there's a bit of complexity to the perspective. And then you can see it from, uh, and it's perfectly positioned because if you're walking up the stairs, you see it, see it from a different vantage point and you can walk past and so on. Um, so there's nothing particularly complex uh, about it from that point of view. Um, but the other thing that uh, was rattling around in my mind is that um, when the early explorers did the coastlines of Australia, they often uh, did maybe five cross-sectional uh, images on the one page because paper was scarce and, uh, and they were trying to communicate what they had seen uh, as rapidly as possible, I guess. Um, and to me, those, those images um, are very important to our understanding of our continent. And uh, I, I wanted to somehow insert that into the, the picture as well. So that's about it from, from me, folks. And, uh, uh, and, and it's been such a privilege uh, to give the painting to the university. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that it puzzles students who pass by it uh, for some time to come. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard, for those insights into the painting and also into the, uh, the larder work. I'll have to look out for it now. Um, well, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our presentation this morning. Thank you very much for attending. We have uh, some morning tea, and if you'd like to join us, you're most welcome. So thank you very much.